Welcome to week two of the stress class if you haven't left already. Um, last week, if you want to find class one, you're going to have to go to my Conscious Creators Facebook group. That group has, um, has besides the stress class, it has a number of, of videos and training and, and valuable things training in the guides. These videos are specifically the same videos that I use in my $2,000 paid self-hypnosis course that people have joined and we've done groups in the past. And you can find that quantumfieldtrips.com. However, don't go pay $2,000 right now because what you can do if you're interested in learning more deep dive into self-hypnosis, how to use it in your life, you can go to my um, join my conscious creators and next week I'm going to give a much a steep steep discount if you want to join our next group course okay so that being said to recap just a little bit about last week's class we talked about how stress shows up in our body uh, according to our central nervous system split into parasympathetic is our rest and digest Sympathetic is our fight, flight, or freeze system. And this is, this is important because this is what our, bo our bodies are so smart, you guys. It like, I want to pull my hair out when I hear people say, my body's fighting me, my body this, my body, if my body would just work better. I promise you, your body is doing everything you tell it to. So if you're something's wrong with your body that you weren't born with, um, <laughs> it's about changing your mind, changing how you perceive things so that you're not directing your body to, you know, do whatever, whatever problem it's doing. For instance, IBS. I have one client that has had extreme excruciating, painful, and embarrassing IBS for the last couple of years since COVID, had a traumatic relationship problem, and then COVID and the isolation on top of that, she ended up with some terrible IBS issues. By the way, if you have some IBS issues, you can listen to a couple of meditations that I designed specifically to heal the digestive system. That aside, what happened, what we figured out was that this IBS wasn't because of outside, okay, backwards to last week, three different kinds of stressors. We have environmental stress. That is things that we take in from our environment, um, smoke that comes from the fires that we're breathing in, pollution, toxicity in our water, our food, COVID, things like that, that's environmental. Physical stress comes from things like pulling your muscles or breaking a bone or, um, you know, sunburn, phys actual physical stress. The largest group of stressors that we have are emotional stressors. It's the stressors we put on ourselves, the stress we feel from the isolation of COVID, the fear that we feel of how is the world going to go? The wars that are happening, the, all those, my family, my toxic relationships, my, my job, all of those stressors are all emotional. And those are things that we can do something about. So those are the ones that I will focus on most. So with that nervous system, that parasympathetic versus the sympathetic, it's designed correctly. Our bodies know what to do. If a uh, way back generations, thousands of years ago, if a saber-toothed tiger came at us, our sympathetic nervous system pops into drive, we get a rush of adrenaline, that HPA axis that I talked about last week, that goes into effect. We get the energy in our extremities to either fight or run away. Okay, so now we don't often have tigers chasing us. And unless you live somewhere that's extremely dangerous, we often don't have physical stressors from robbers or abusive people. Most of the stress is perceived. However, our body doesn't know the difference. So if you're watching 
say The Walking Dead. I know that's like years gone by, but we just started watching it with my stepson and it's comical, but also I have definitely had times where I can feel my, my stomach tighten, my shoulders tighten, and I have to turn away. That is my body literally reacting to the stress that I'm taking in. It doesn't realize I'm just watching a show. So that's why it's so important to get a hold of our stress and learn how to use it for our benefit rather than a deficit. So next week, we're going to talk about specifically how to do that, how to flip it and make it your friend, because there are plenty of people that see stress as benefit, as a benefit. And so it is it and it happens on a physical level. And we're going to talk about that next week for this week. I want to talk about mostly directed at or for our children and for other members that we might be um, in charge of caring for. We have um, some people have elderly people or or even our, our significant others or siblings that deal with chronic stress. And we call it PTSD, we call it anxiety, we call it depression. There are many names for the same thing. Bottom line is our body is experiencing that fight or flight. Except for if you look at an animal, let's say a deer or an antelope, and the tiger comes to chase it and it jumps into that, that fight or flight and dashes off and runs to safety. As soon as it's in a safe place, guess what happens? They're not like jumping all around. They know they're safe. They're, they start eating. They just graze, they relax, they go back into the rest and digest mode. Humans are supposed to do that too. However, we're not always good at that. We, because our minds are so full and with, with social media and the news and technology and burning the candle at both ends, we find ourselves stuck in this fight or flight feeling. So let me tell you what happens there to your body. When you're in fight or flight, your energy needs to go to the extremities. We need extra glucose to give us that energy. So a few things happen in the body physiologically if you maintain that fight or flight for a long time. Number one, you're gonna find that you're having issues with sleeping because it's really hard to rest and sleep when you're paranoid, when you're feeling the extra energy from the adrenaline money running through your body. Um, you, you haven't burned off that glucose yet. So it's like you've just eaten a power bar ready to go work out, except you're just watching TV or you're laying down trying to sleep and it just doesn't work very well. So sleep issues are, are a one thing that you're going to see pretty quickly. Another thing is digestive issues. I talked a little bit, oh gosh, I might've been a this might have been on mute. So if I repeat myself, I apologize. This is new for anybody else that's just joining us. I have a specific client that a couple of years ago with the isolation of COVID and also traumatic relationship experience, she developed a pretty severe case of IBS. I And embarrassing too. Anybody that deals with IBS, it changes your life. It gets in the way of how you want to experience your life. What we found was after a number of tests from doctors, this IBS wasn't due to allergies. It wasn't due to environmental. It was her perception of stress and what was going on in her life. The reason she knew that is because she moved, symptoms completely went away. She moved again and with different stressors coming back in her life, it all returned with a vengeance. So we worked together. We had a few one-on-one -on -one sessions. She actually joined my um, Create Your Reality self-hypnosis course, and she has done an amazing job at bringing her body back into regulation without medication. Now, I'm not saying that doing, having, using medication is, is bad or wrong. Sometimes medication is necessary for the training wheels to get your body back to where it needs to be. Sometimes it's your mind back to where, it's, and I should mention that she uh, actually is using 
um, the, the new stress formula from Hemp Lucid. I absolutely love it. I helped to design it back when I was working with Hemp Lucid it has functional mushrooms, their premium CBD and a number of herbs specifically designed to help you, your body move into a parasympathetic state to, to correct that HPA axis imbalance that's going on. So that's a whole other, if you want more information for on that, reach out to me, um, DM me and I'll, I'll <laughs> in the background, I keep seeing Facebook live and it's going the opposite direction and it's a little bit behind. So I just keep my, see my hands flip out here and there. Okay. So, um, also, Hello, my name is Renee and I have ADD. So occasionally I go squirrel and then that's one of those instances. Okay, bringing it back to stress. So how can we help our children or our loved ones that are stuck in this stress cycle? Number one, you can add, you can bring in some of those coping tools we talked about last week. Again, if you, if you're, if you didn't see last week's stress class, that's in the conscious creators course, you can uh, put in a comment here, I'll redirect you so that you make sure that you're on the, on the final class for next week. Uh, a lot of tools like tapping, you ever done tapping? It like interrupts the, the triggers and helps the, the energy flow for balance. A havening touch, that's one where you, you just move your hands gently, tickle down your face. This works great for toddlers who are, are um, you know, they're stuck in that, that stress or maybe not in the middle of their tantrum. If they'll let you touch you, touch them. Yes, just start stroking. I used to put my babies to sleep this way, just stroking gently down their face even over their eyeballs to help them close their eyes, but down their arms, just that gentle touch. Humans naturally love gentle touch. Now, if that's disturbing for somebody, we never want to push it on them. Like hugs are not always great. Some people absolutely despise anybody touching them. My husband's one of those and I'm, I'm the rare exception of people that are allowed to hug him and allowed to, to gently touch. So be aware of that. Uh, if you see, if it's a friend or colleague or somebody that is stressed out and you think, oh, you just need a hug. Maybe not ask first if you need a hug. So, okay. That's um, not where I wanted to go either. Okay. So there are a lot, I'm not going to go through all of those right now because I did last week. You can go and revisit that last class. It's in the guides and um, get all kinds of help on ideas for coping. One thing I wanted to address because some people have asked me since then, isn't coping bad? Don't we want to like focus on healing and not just coping? And that's a yes and no. It's a sometimes we need to start with the coping, kind of like the medication or the supplements. We need training wheels to get our body in a calm state first so that then we can do the work. So I'm going to actually share my screen for a moment. So here we are. Here's our brain for people that haven't like listened to a dozen of my videos already. I'm going to go really quick for people that have already listened to a dozen of my videos and you understand the conscious and subconscious mind. Um, but for, for those of you that don't know where it's split, we have our conscious mind that we think we're in charge of. We think we're in charge of our life, right? We think we know what we're doing and what we want. Well, our conscious mind it can only handle about 40 bits per second of information. And, and we really are doing very little with our conscious mind. Our subconscious mind, however, you know, if it's the line should be tiny right here, but the subconscious mind really covers everything. The subconscious mind helps us breathe. It helps uh, our heartbeat, all of these things that we don't want to pay attention to, that we don't have time to pay attention to because we're focused on this tiny window of conscious thinking the subconscious mind takes care of it. And that's good. It takes care of our autonomic nervous system. However, if in our subconscious mind, we have the program that, um, 
Okay, I'm going to use this one because this is something I came up with uh, with a client just this last week. Uh, you maybe as a child you were caught, knocked down a wasp's nest, and you were stung multiple times, uh, dozens and dozens of times. So then you have now you have this absolute fear of not just wasps but anything that flies, and you freak out because you we live in a world where there are a lot of flying things, right? And so if even though you're walking down a park path and a fly goes past, the fly's not going to harm you. It, you we don't have to bring that fear or fight or flight stress response for a fly. But if you have a program here in your subconscious mind that flying things will kill you, then that is how your body's going to respond. This is the same for, have you ever seen dogs or cats that have been abused by men? And then they go to a good new home. And even though you're a loving, kind home, they might either bark or, or bite or cower at the sight of a man. And, and it's, it's such a sad thing, but this is how our subconscious mind works. So. Yes, in the end, we want to do the work. We want to go in and flip and fix this so that so that that automatic response just doesn't pop out out of nowhere when it's not needed. It's like our conscious mind needs to give the directions to our subconscious mind. That's that's how it is. Where it's if our brain is a computer which it very much it is very much like a computer. We are the programmer or we allow other people to program. You ever thought about the fact that TV programs, it's called programming. It literally programs things in our mind because we're in a hypnotic state while we're watching TV. We're, we're intending to relax and um, just we take down the guard of our conscious mind. And so we just let everything through that filter. I don't know if you noticed that there's that line. That's our filter. It's a literal thing. It's called the reticular activating system. Some people also call it the critical factor filters, what I'll use it in, in my hypnosis classes. But we soften that when we're watching programming. And guess what? Your kids do too. If your children are less than 10 years old, they're pretty soft anyway. You ever wonder why kids are so gullible? Like they believe anything you tell them? It's because that critical factor filter isn't solid yet in their brain. And so they just believe you. They're just, it's not that they're gullible, they're trusting. Everything comes in as fact. And that's how we learn. That's how children learn so much. They can learn multiple languages where, where we take like five years to learn three words. Um, you know, that's exaggeration, but kind of literal for me. So understanding that gives you leverage with your children because you know that they're kind of in a hypnotic state already. The reason, okay, so now we're going to go into why that is so important. I'm going to tell a quick embarrassing story. Um, I shared this, oh, I shared that one last week. Okay, what's another one that I just have? Okay, uh, I don't know what they're called, maybe transformers, but like when you drive down the street, there's telephone, regular telephone pole, poles, and then there's the giant metal things that have the they look like arms to me, holding wires and the legs go out. So if you look at it, it looks like a robot, right? It's got, it's got the top and then it's got the arms and it's got the legs and it's carrying all these wires. So when I, I didn't get out much as a child, <laughs> we just didn't travel, move around. So when I took my first long trip somewhere, I'm looking at all these alien robots on the side of the road. And because I was extremely shy, I was the ninth of 10 children. So I wasn't heard very often. 
I just got used to being quiet because nobody listened to me. Nobody listened to me anyway. So looking at these, I literally thought they were alien robots carrying all of these wires that they're going to take over the world. Where I got that idea, I don't know, but it terrified me. And I wondered why my parents were driving down the street and not concerned with this. And then I thought, because children have such great imaginations, you guys, I thought maybe I'm special and I have supervision. Nobody else can see these but children. And so it's just all kinds of things spun in my mind. And I don't know, I'm not sure at what age that finally clicked that what those literally were, but I want to tell you that your children have just as good imagination as me. If you can think back that far to your childhood, I bet you have something too. I, I've talked to just about anybody can think of, oh my gosh, yeah, I can't believe I, I, that's what I thought. Or watching TV shows or listening to songs, you get the words wrong and you come up with this whole story to make it make sense. And that's what our kids do. So children, babies, most, okay, I'm going to try not to cry right now because most babies are born happy and um, taken care of. They have parents that love them. There are some children that born are born into stress. They uh, either are taken away from their mothers or they're, um, they're starving whatever the case name may be, but that is, thank God, few and far between. If you are a mother of, or a father of a child that had a traumatic experience in the beginning of their life, in those, those um, infant stages, just reach out to me personally because I'm not going to get into that right now, but there are things you can do to help help reprogram those that stress response from early childhood. Um, for the most part though, children learn how to be stressed. Guess where they learn it from? Mom and dad or siblings or school, uh, bullying. We learn how to be stressed. We also can learn how to be relaxed. So I had a friend and we went to Cedar Point. If you don't know what Cedar Point is, it's the world's largest roller coaster park. But we had little ones. So we were going on the kitty rides. This woman's baby was less than two, I believe, hadn't ever been on any kind of carnival ride. And so we put her on with my daughter, who was a, about a year older, on this little easy kitty spinny ride. This little girl was a firecracker. She, she's run anywhere, loud, boisterous, so much fun. So we're just like, oh, this is going to be fun. So we put them on the roller coaster. It wasn't a roller coaster. It was just a back and forth little spinny ride. And we're watching. And I personally am terrified of roller coasters. But I didn't want that for my kids. My husband at the time was a huge roller coaster fan. And so my kids were good. They couldn't wait till they were tall enough to get on them. So this is this woman's first experience with her child on the ride. And she's watching her. And I can see the little girl looking for mom because that's what babies do. Children look to their parents. This is a new experience. What do we feel when we're in a new experience? A little bit of concern, a little bit of stress. How do I respond to this? So we look to mom. She finds her eyesight catches mom. And I can see the expression on her face is just, I don't know about this. I'm not sure. And mom's response was, oh my gosh, she doesn't like it. And so guess what happened when baby sees mom? <gasps> Like that, she starts to cry. She, we read body language from the get-go. That's how we survive by reading body language. So this little one-year-old sees mom, sees she's terrified and immediately is terrified. So then guess what? 
she goes for I don't know how many years because I don't I don't know her anymore. So hopefully she likes roller coasters now. But for the first 10 years of her life, she was terrified. And that wasn't even her. That was mom. So the first number one piece of advice I will give you with your children is to model better stress behavior. So if you haven't gotten your own stress in line, go watch my last week's class, learn about the some coping mechanisms and watch next week's class so that we can shift our brains and move our perception into a way to enjoy and use maybe not enjoy, but use stress as a tool to move forward, not be afraid of stress. We don't have to be afraid of stress. Okay. So that's number one, model better behavior, do your own work. You know, the saying when, when you're on a plane and the oxygen masks fall, what do they say? Put the oxygen mask on you first and then take care of your child. So same with stress, take care of your stress and how you respond to stress and then you'll be able to help your children more with stress, their stress. Okay, now besides that, I'm gonna give you th two more, three more ways that you can help your children cope with stress. So we're back to the coping. Mirroring is, is um, the first one. We have mirror neurons in our brain and they, this is how we use our body language. This is how we, re we respond. And if you have done a one-on-one -on -one session with me or any other a hypnotherapist, you're going to be like, oh, this is how they do it. So when you're with somebody in conversation, there's a few things that you can do to build rapport. Rapport is where you trust. You have that trust factor. Hopefully your children trust you. If not, you need to build that trust. There are so many you know, like parenting books. There's, there's, I'm not going to get, we, we have 20 minutes. So I'm not going to get into all of the ways to do that. However, that trust is crucial. You're the first person that they rely on to give them direction on how to learn and deal with life. So if they have trust issues with you, that's the first level of stress that we need to work through. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be a perfect parent. I have never been a perfect parent. You can ask all my children and I have like been in a, <laughs> you can, I see crystals on here. I actually, she's a client of mine and, and we did an interview, you can watch her interview and we talk about how there are days where they have a meltdown and you melt down with them and you're in puddles of tears and, uh, and you yell and you do something wrong and then you have to come back and you say, I'm sorry. So that is key for building trust. You don't have to be perfect. You do have to own when you're not perfect and they will see that and they understand that. And then that helps them to understand. I don't have to be perfect either. So it gives them permission to be okay with making mistakes. My number one, uh, person that is super stressed out as a child are the little bitty perfectionists. The ones that think they have to be good all the time. The ones that are told that they're smart and told that they're good and told that they're blah, 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 blah so many times that now they have in their head, I have to be this way or else I'm not gonna be loved. I'm not going to be accepted. We make up, remember all those stories. So, giving them permission to make mistakes. And how do we do that? Number one, modeling, just like anything else, model, model, model. So if you're a perfectionist, please join my group so we can get you over that. Uh, <laughs> but besides the fact that just, just don't do it. Help your children by helping them be okay with making mistakes because that's how we learn. That's how we learn. Okay, so we build rapport. We give them permission. And now the, the mirroring, this is, this is um, how when you're in a session, you start talking at the same cadence as your client. And so if you're working with a child and they come in and they're all stressed out, first, go ahead and match them, match their breathing patterns. Oh my gosh, you had a rough day. Tell me about it. <gasps> 
You, you just get your energy up with theirs. And then they know you're listening. They know you're paying attention. You make eye contact. You get off your phone. You stop doing the dishes. You stop doing the laundry. You stop doing whatever you're doing. And you give them your attention, which I say that for myself because I don't know how many times my oldest grabbed my face and said, mama, mama, so that I would look at him. So, you know, calling myself out. But you stop what you're doing so you're looking them in the eyes and being with them in their stress. That's the empathy part. And then you slowly start to shift. You bring your breathing to a slower pattern and you bring your voice into a calm state and you start to slow the cadence of your speech. And as you're replying to them so that they know you're listening and you, um, <clears throat> you talk, you give suggestions, or, or you ask questions, really, questions are better than suggestions. You're slowing everything down, which then gives them permission to slow and calm their little bodies down without even saying anything. And this works for adults too, by the way, your, your significant other, somebody comes home from work and they're super stressed or ticked off or whatever it is, match their energy first, and then slow it down. Because one way to take somebody who's already in this high state and escalate it is by saying, calm down. Okay, so um, I don't see Facebook right now, but like if you have heard and if anybody's ever told you that and you wanted to poke their eyes out, give me a thumbs up or a heart or something because <laughs> I know that's the case for me and, and, or that's kind of like the period question. Are you on your period? Yeah. Uh, even if you are. Um, so, so questions or, or commands like that are not helpful. Instead, bring yourself, <laughs> like how I said, your, bring yourself into a state of calm and they will start to match it. It's that same permission thing. It gives them permission to relax and calm down. So we have the mirroring, we give them opportunity to mirror our response. We have the rapport, we make sure that they trust us so that, and that we are trustworthy so that they can come to us when they have problems and we model better behavior. And part of that is learning better behavior yourself in this, in stressful situations, in anxiety. So what is anxiety anyway, just a little, we have the stress, we know the stress response. We have different types of, we have fight or flight. Fight feels like anxiety, doesn't it? Anxiety is worry future-based. I don't know if this is gonna go through. How am I gonna pay my bills? How is, do they really like me? What do they think of me? Am I enough? All of this worry for the future. And so that's anxiety-based, stress. Depression is past, usually past or, or present based. I'm not good enough, something, and, and it brings you down. It holds, it weights you down. That's still stress on the body. So remember, whichever way you swing, fight or flight, it's still the same stress on the body. So there are a lot of different ways to name stress. And that was just a, a tangent. I'm not sure why I went down that road. Um, but in case you didn't know, now you know. So mirroring, we, we've, we're just talking about mirroring with your children. When that one thing I want to touch on with children, these are usually younger children, but older children as well. In the middle of the meltdown, Okay, we're just going to call it a meltdown or a temper tantrum. They're in that, they're not in their conscious mind. They're like, you're looking at them going, who are you right now? Where's my sweet little child? Because they're in that amygdala base, amygdala hijack is what they call it. Their, their subconscious fear programming is coming through. In that space, you cannot reason with them. And you can't reason with an adult either. When you're in that space, the only thing you can do is help with that mirroring. Breathing slowly, keeping your voice 
calmer and more calm, keeping yourself intact. Boundaries is the next thing I want to talk to. And this is from a professional psychologist is you don't allow the poor behavior because that, that behaviors come up from probably when they were a baby, crying got you to hold, soothe, whatever they wanted that you're trying to get them to calm down and it's still carrying over. So they need to know now if they're over a year old, they need to understand and learn that this isn't appropriate behavior. So we put them in a safe place. We give them their timeout or their bedroom and we let them know calmly when you're ready to talk, mommy's here and or, or auntie's here, you're, whoever you are to them. And that also goes for adults. When there's somebody in an amygdala hijack, especially if there's drugs or alcohol involved, please don't try to reason with them. That's how we end up in abusive situations. We, I'm not gonna get too deep into this because I, I don't want to give medical advice or, or um, psychology advice. However, you want to keep yourself safe. And so giving distance and just repeating in a calm voice, I need a minute. I need a minute to think we can talk about this in a few minutes or putting on some music, something, something that's going to help them move out of that amygdala hijack. That's what we're looking for. With children, they're much easier. So that's what we're talking about today specifically. Give them the time and the space on their own to calm down. Let them beat their fist, let them beat their pillow up. As long as they're doing it as safely, they're not like breaking your thing because then there are consequences. You need to remember that that stress response brings up the glucose. So you have all this energy now, let them burn it out. Give them an outlet even to hit your pillow. Uh, go run a lap. I used to, I had a, a house that had, you could run from the kitchen around the fireplace and through the dining room, living room and back. And I would make my children do laps when they were, I could see their stress level was rising. I would get them before they broke over into the tantrum phase and I would make them run out that energy or push-ups or whatever dancing let's have a dance party and then talk about it afterwards so those are just ideas we, we want to burn out that energy from the stress and then when they're in a calm straight state you can ask questions find out and then that's the last thing that i want to talk about is to find out what's going on in their little minds are they afraid that there are aliens on the side of the road taking over the world are they afraid there are armies marching around their neighborhood because they can hear their heartbeat like I did in their ear? Find out what they're thinking. And the best way to do that is ask questions. What do you think about that? Now, kids are, are different than adults. They're uh, sometimes not comfortable looking you in the eye, especially if there's any level of autism. So I find that it's easiest to talk to children if there's an activity, get their little hands moving, color, do puzzles, go for a walk, and then start asking or telling stories. <clears throat> Excuse me. The last thing is called covert hypnosis. And that is something we've been doing for thousands of years. It's just called storytelling. We find, um, and quick story, my mother did this actually, and it stuck with me. Me and my sister were fighting like crazy. And <clears throat> one of us, I won't say who, liked to, to say, I hate you. I wish you were never born. And my mom, instead of punishing us or yelling at us, she sat us down and she told us a story of these two sisters. And they... They loved each other and they hated each other. And one day before school, the one got in a fight because of some reason I don't remember, but you know, she made it a good story. And the other sister yelled at her, I hate you. I wish you were never born. And she ran out of the door into the bus stop. And the little sister trying to catch her ran and got hit by a car and she died. 
And so that bigger sister had to live the rest of her life knowing that the last words that she said was, I hate you to her sister who she loved. And it's just a story. I doubt it was even true, but it went into my mind and deep into my subconscious and into my heart. And I knew that I never wanted to hate my sister again. I wanted to just show love, not just to my sister, but to everybody. So don't underestimate the power of stories. That's why all scriptures, Bible, Gita, Quran, they all have powerful imagery and stories. If you listen to my any of my meditations or suggestive therapy, you're going to see imagery there because it gets into our subconscious mind and lays roots. So try that out with your kids. And um, before we finish, are there any, let me shut this down and see if I can get over to Facebook. If there are any questions, post them in the comments. And, um, and I'll get, I'll go ahead and get back to them later. I also, I said earlier that I would, uh, for, for my conscious creator group, uh, I would give a freebie to anybody that attended. If you want that freebie, I have a, what is it called? It's a mini course. It's all about manifestation. You, we all manifest. We create the lives that we're living right now with our thoughts and then we create our actions and we do things based on us. Maybe we're held back, we're debilitated by fear and stress. And so we're not living the life that we want because those things are holding us back, but it's still us that's holding us back. Does that make sense? So when we hear manifestation, it's not all the crystals and woo woo that you might think, it's just learning how to use your conscious mind to get what you want and um, level your subconscious mind. So if you, it's just two hours, if you want that free mini course, send me a private message or an email, ruthierene at gmail.com. And I will send that right over to you for free just for attending this class. And then again, next week, we're going to talk to how to make stress your friend. So that's gonna be specifically how to flip it when you feel like you're the type of person that stress comes and you tighten and your stomach gets all twisted and you can't breathe right, or you have panic attacks, we're going to learn how the people that are out there, the multimillionaire CEOs, thrive on stress and they say, bring it on. They're, they ride that wave instead of being pummeled by it. We're going to learn how to do that next week. So join me. Hopefully, I get it figured out how to loop it into my um, Facebook group. If not, I, I guess I'll be out live on here again and look for if you have trauma in the past that is now creating stress in your now life or in the future, specifically wrapped around one person. I just posted a meditation on my YouTube channel that is about 30 minutes guided imagery to get you to let go completely of that one person. Not, not the, you're not going to lose your memory or anything like that. You're just going to let go of the pain. Wouldn't that be nice? Like you think of a memory of somebody that hurt you and it still makes knots in your stomach or still hurts your heart. Wouldn't it be nice if you'd be like, right, yeah, that happened. And this is what I learned from it. So that's what you can get from that, that um, meditation. I hope you take advantage of it. It's free on YouTube and I'll post it in, in Facebook as well. So thank you so much for joining me. Uh, sorry about all of the technical difficulties in the beginning, especially the mute. I almost said mutation, but it was just me muted, that's all. Thanks and have a wonderful day, everybody. Enjoy your weekend.